I am Thor Sipus and I am the founder and chairman of the Iceland Ocean Cluster. From what you know of Canada's fisheries and overall ocean economy, uh, what do you identify as some of our strengths and weaknesses and what do you see as some of our biggest opportunities and, and threats? That's a big question that I'll, I'll try to answer. Actually, we've been in all kinds of connections with Canada for, uh, in my case, nearly seven or eight years. And it's been absolutely great. I mean, this is, of course, in, in many ways, with regards to comparison with Iceland, it's a superpower, definitely. You are rich with resources. And uh, I feel now with uh, superclusters, for instance, that the government is doing quite well with the strategy behind sort of the innovation work ahead. What I feel a little bit, what I'm a little bit worried about is that in most cases, I've been meeting institutions, great people from organizations and institutions. I rarely have met fishermen or seafood people or entrepreneurs in, in, in my sector, which is of course the seafood and the sort of the ocean space. And it, it worries me a bit. And I'm sometimes wonder, wondering if that's the weakness partly is that there are probably lack of leadership from the business side in the innovation needed for the seafood sector. Once again, keep in mind that I'm not talking about the whole ocean sector. I see you have so many interesting high-tech uh, concepts there, but in terms of the seafood sector, there, this might be one of the weaknesses that I've seen. So uh, thank you, Thor. Looking at those uh, strengths and weaknesses, what do you think we have to prioritize right now and who has to take the lead uh, to build on those strengths and weaknesses going forward? That's a good question again. I think one of the things that I see is that what we did in the beginning with the Iceland Ocean Cluster, which is now nearly 10 years old, is basically to start to tell stories. What is so amazing is that the ocean is so often forgotten that we feel that there was this need to tell the stories, the success stories. And of course, as we started to create our own success stories, we got the media very much involved, the social uh, media as well. So I think that's a very big part of the whole thing is to inspire the whole nation and, and allow me to be a little bit pompous with that. That I think we did it, of course, in a small country like ours, but we were showing examples of how we could do it and how, what we were doing. And we were able to inspire people through that. I think that's one thing. I think the other thing to keep in mind, as I see it, is that the ocean supercluster, the Canadian one, is actually taking fairly sensible step to begin with. They are emphasizing on startups, which I like. They're emphasizing on large collaboration projects, which I think is also very sensible. Uh, the good thing about the Iceland Ocean Cluster is that coming from a small country, we could also be emphasizing on fairly small, low-hanging fruits in local areas, fishing villages. And I think it's very important that this sort of trickles down, not only into these large global or national uh, themes, but rather try to find ways to do it more in terms of the localities and the coastal areas. What I would like to say also is that our success comes also partly from the fact that uh, we have lots of government grants competitive grants. And they, in, in a sense, have actually led to more collaboration between companies, startups, R&D, etc. So they themselves have become like small clusters. And people that I thought would never collaborate with others, as soon as the government said, we're willing to grant you money if you collaborate with others and create a little bit bigger picture, they started to collaborate and the trust built. And the trust is the key here. We need more trust, especially in a natural resource industry like ours, where, where we tend to have people that are keeping these resources for themselves. I know that uh, at, a, at, a, at a big picture level, you personally advocate for the full utilization of the fish resource to get the most value out of it. And here in Canada, it is sometimes an issue we have across other sectors where we are known to export natural resources, not always to add value on those. Uh, and this is probably more important than ever in a, in a tech driven kind of word, uh, world. Sorry. So what changes in thinking or in practice do you think should be implemented? And uh, what must a country like Canada do to achieve this goal of adding more value to its resources? I think what has been very valuable for us at the Iceland Ocean Cluster is to start sort of talking in the same terms as the business world, as the seafood world would do. 
Sometimes I felt when we started the cluster, there was this research a bit far away from the industry and they were talking a bit differently. So we thought it was very important to bring out sort of the, the message of how this could actually become a real business. And I take often the, the, the fishkin economy in Iceland as an example. This is an economy that did not exist some 15, 20 years ago. There was zero value from the fishkin. We're now up to nearly $30 million in value just from the fishkin of the cod. And I think it just, just to show the value that we have in this, these proteins of the oceans, that sometimes we're kind of blinded ourselves. And I want to take a few examples if, if that's okay. Let's do the fishkin. So I have here just one example that I want to show you, or a few of them. So this is basically leather, fish leather. And this has actually been developing in Iceland. And now this fish skin is actually worth around 8 to $10 a piece, which is similar to the fillet. So suddenly we have a leather piece of fish skin that is actually creating similar value as the fillet itself. Then we have other products that are coming from Iceland right now, and that's basically the, the fish collagen. We're now setting up a small, uh, not a small, a factory that is all going to do 3,000 metric tons of fish skin. And basically collagen is just a powder, which is good for your joints. And this is actually going to be 300 metric tons made in Iceland, worth a kilo, probably around $20 dusk, probably $70 to $100 if it's, if it's uh, retail. Once again, remember this is product that did not exist and this was mostly used for dump sites in Iceland in the past. Now, actually, sadly, still in many countries, including Canada, it is not used that much. It's basically waste, to be clear. It's basically waste. One of the most popular drink in Iceland now is actually an alternative drink called Kolab. It's actually just a soda drink with, uh, with fish in it. It may be that Icelanders are kind of weird with the, the whole fish thing, but at least... We are, this is becoming one of the most popular drinks now in Iceland. It tastes great. And the fact is, we're creating jobs with it as well. We're not throwing a, a, these marvelous proteins away. We're actually creating jobs and interesting products domestically. Finally, I would like to drop in the, the wound care. So this is basically from the fish skin. This is wound care for the medical sector in the world. This, uh, the, the largest pieces of fish skin used for this wound care on, in hospitals is worth around $2,000 a piece. So suddenly we're saying we are realizing only with the fish skin we can create jobs, we can create value, and we have lots of research to be do done in this area, but at least we know there are opportunities. And we should not forget that we are talking about the most sustainable, traceable, and natural proteins in the world. And we're still using those in, in large numbers for the dump sites in, in these countries. That's the sad part. The great part is, of course, we can change this. It does take a lot of effort to use the whole value chain to do so, but we can do it. Great, very clear answer again. We're about halfway, by the way. I was just going to do what perhaps you're doing too. I don't know, grabbing a glass. I like that. Let's do collagen. Mm. Is that one of those drinks? Yeah, it's actually quite good. I need to, you know, to get it one day when you when you visit. Is it what you call an acquired taste? Yeah, no, it, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't needed to be acquired taste. Actually, it's a little bit protein taste. Of course, this is very much like a protein. So the, right. it, there is a little bit protein taste, but it's it's sugar less, sugar free as well. So it's wow. pretty good. And it's obviously changed your life completely. I mean. You, you, you've lost weight, your skin is shinier, your, yeah, hair, exactly. your hair is growing you faster. You get it, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay, I'm ready when you are for the rest of the questions. Yeah. How can Canada think broader than just one species, usually cod, uh, and think about species-specific technologies and applications uh, to develop, you know, the various fisheries on all of our, on all of our coasts, basically? Of course, this has to do very much with fisheries management, and I'm not sure how to answer it with regards to Canada, but at least it's very important to keep in mind that there are new resources coming in, sometimes invading species, so there needs to be a lot of research being done, and I know research is heavy on this in Canada as well. But to follow that, we need also the entrepreneurs to 
test new products and test new fisheries. Often these are the small fisheries that are more, more sort of hands-on there. We, for instance, have had much less crustacean shells than you have. And that's especially an area where many small fisheries, entrepreneurs in small fisheries are, are entering. So that, that, that's one point. The other point that I want to make is actually the fact that as soon as you get more demand for the byproducts of certain fish, you might actually see more interest in certain fish that is not being caught right now. It might be the rose of a certain species that has a very small fillet. It might, might actually be the fish skin as well. So as soon as we emphasize further the 100% utilization, we get this movement going. And I think that's what's happened in Iceland in, in some cases, that we're seeing some species now being, being uh, caught due to the fact that when you look at the whole fish, there's more value in it than if you would just take the small fillet and throw the rest. So you've already shared uh, some great uh, recommendations. I'm going to ask you to continue on that uh, on that uh, row of uh, of success. Um, what would be your recommendation or recommendations plural to the leaders of Canada's ocean supercluster uh, in order to uh, build a strong ocean economy in the short, medium, and in the long term? I would emphasize telling the stories. I would emphasize a good ecosystem. Take the whole ecosystem and look at it as a whole and try to work with that. And I think it's so important to understand also that the fishermen will never become the pharmacists. So you need to bring in new people and they will love it because what they worry sometimes, and I found it in the beginning when I started talking to fishermen about the nutraceutical industry, it, it's a completely different cup of tea. And you shouldn't be addressing this necessarily only to fishermen that have done very well in their fishing for years. You need to bring in new people. So that's the beauty of the cluster as well. And I found that to be the most important part of the cluster to nurture this collaboration, be the matchmaker between different parts. We need a dynamic startup community. I'm really pleased to see that in various uh, cities now around Canada, mainly, of course, what I know from is the East Coast. There are now startup communities and startups being created. I was in Halifax the other day and I see a lot of dynamism, dynamism in, in that area and I could go further north, etc. So I think you have so many of the, the elements that, that are needed. Tell as many, just absolutely go out and tell as many as you as you can about the successes of this and how this is changing the, the whole ocean economy. And finally, probably, and not least, never lose sight of the fact that the cluster will never be stronger than the leaders that are with you. And clusters will never become a government institution. They should never, because they have this, they need to have this urge to connect people. I have nothing against government institutions, but the fact is, this is different. They, the, the, we need business leaders, we need le leaders from the startup community to get together with the research and with government, but keep them in the leadership position in the cluster. If so, you keep the dynamism. I'm sometimes asked how my mission became as it is and what we do on a daily basis. I don't come up with the ideas. It's basically from the grassroots. It's from the business world and from the startup community. And it is very important to keep not doing upside down, rather downside up with regards to how the cluster develops and the project that you're focusing on. Mm -hmm.